And as violence escalates in the Middle East, Secretary of State Blinken visited the occupied West Bank today, where he met with the president of the Palestinian Authority, Mahmoud Abbas. This comes amid one of the deadliest months in the West Bank and in Israel in several years. Before leaving the region, Secretary Blinken called once again for both the Israelis and Palestinians to reduce tensions. We have been clear and consistent in our conviction that uh, neither side should take uh, any unilateral actions that right now potentially would, would add fuel to a fire and over the uh, medium to long term uh, would make uh, the prospects of achieving two states even more distant than, um, than they currently are. And in a rebuke to Prime Minister Netanyahu, Blinken also met with Israeli civil society leaders who have been protesting against Netanyahu's new extreme right-wing government. Joining me now is Richard Haas, the president of the Council on Foreign Relations. He served in the Pentagon, State Department, and White House under four presidents. And his new book is The Bill of Obligations, The Ten Habits of Good Citizens. Richard, congratulations on the book. I want to talk to you about this. Uh, coming up in just a second, but first let's talk about the Middle East today. You've worked on this for so long. How did Secretary Blinken navigate discussions with both a very, very weak Palestinian leader and Prime Minister Netanyahu, who was so opposed to the Obama-Biden administration and took so many positions contrary to their policies? Well, the bottom line, Andrew, and I'm not comfortable saying it, is he really can't navigate it or he can do it without much, if any, effect. People have tuned us out. This Israeli government is not open to the kinds of arguments the United States would make. The Palestinian leadership is too weak to do anything about it. It's too divided. So you've got a situation where we, you and I, for years, and others called the peace process. Essentially, the process has stopped dead in its tracks. And what you have on both sides, the Israeli government with the settlers, the Palestinians with younger Palestinians, increasingly things are out of control that uh, the authorities are in many ways lacking authority. So I think that you've got a terrible situation where diplomacy is not going to make any progress, and the situation on the ground, as we've seen, is likely to deteriorate. And that doesn't mean that the U.S. and Israel don't have shared, um, shared priorities, including expanding Israeli-Arab normalization and shared mutual defense in the region with the Arabs in Israel. But then on Iran, as toxic as the situation is on many levels with Israel and the U.S. and Iran, they really still believe that a nuclear agreement down the road is better than nothing. And, of course, Netanyahu was one of the people with Donald Trump who scuttled it. Well, I actually think there's pretty much no chance now of an agreement, right. uh, the agreement reviving with Iran. I think, actually, there, there's a bit of overlap between the U.S. and Israeli governments, that Iran cannot be allowed to gain nuclear weapons or even get to the to the, the brink of it. Israel seemed to have carried out attacks the other day on some Iranian uh, capabilities near Isfahan. I didn't see the U.S. particularly uh, criticizing it. I think you know, the real question also is, you know, we can compartmentalize to a degree there. It'll be interesting, Angie, to see if there's any movement on the so-called Abraham Accords. Arab states were willing to reach out to Israel. They parked the Palestinian issue to the side. And I think there's two big questions. Will Saudi Arabia move ahead if the situation on the ground grows worse? I think there's reasons to be skeptical. And will the countries in the Arab world that have already made peace with Israel, like the UAE and Bahrain, could there be a bit of backsliding if things get bad enough, particularly around Islamic holy places? So I would simply say, uh, you know, once again, I, I fear the Middle East will, will be a source of, of problematic news. Now, in your book, you, you talk urgently about the significant threat to our democracy, the Bill of Obligations. Uh, Americans need to know about their citizenship, know about their obligations, and then act on it. Absolutely. This was a, this was a country founded on an idea. We haven't always lived up to our ideas or our ideals, but it was, fo it was founded on things like equal opportunity and equality of, of persons. And But we don't, we don't teach this story. We don't teach our history. So why will Americans value this, this democracy? How will they know what it takes to, to make it work? 
We barely teach it in our schools. We don't require it as a condition of graduation in the lion's share of our colleges and universities. So I think we've got a lot of work to do, Andrea, to make sure this democracy of ours endures another couple of centuries. And as we learned the hard way on January 6th, we can't take anything for granted. We can't dismiss the possibility of politically inspired violence in this country. So I'm hoping that we, we really begin to focus on what it will take uh, for this democracy to, to be robust, whether it's in Washington, so we can meet some of our challenges. But I think for parents, for educators, for religious leaders, I think there's a lot of work to be done around this society. Richard Haas, this is must reading in every school, in every classroom and at home. Thank you very much.